Welcome to the 2021 Virtual Fall Lecture Series hosted by Grey Roots Museum and Archives. I'm your host, Karen Noble. We acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the Anishinaabek, Six Nations of the Grand River, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat, Wyandat, Wyandat peoples on whose traditional territories we gather and whose ancestors signed treaties with our ancestors. We recognize also the Métis and Inuit whose ancestors shared this land and these waters. May we all, as treaty people, live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all its diverse peoples. Thank you. The final talk of the series next Tuesday, November 30th at 1 p.m. is Traces of the Durham Road's Black Pioneers with Naomi Norquay. Before we begin, there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. You are welcome to submit a question in the YouTube comments. Please note, you must be logged into a YouTube account to do so. If you are watching on greyroots.com, access the YouTube, YouTube page by clicking on watchonyoutube.com in the bottom right of the video player. You can also submit a question to Greyroots through Facebook Messenger or, or over email to media at greyroots.com. Thank you to Zach Erb, Media and Communications Coordinator at Grey Roots for providing technical support for the series. And now for the presentation of the day, Caring for Collections at Home. This talk will remain posted to view, so if you lose your connection, have to stop watching, want to watch any part again, or tell a friend, you can still do so. You can still do so. Link available from greyroots.com or visit the Grey Roots Museum and Archives YouTube channel. Originally from Owen Sound, Ontario, today's presenter, Nikita Johnston, has an honors BA in anthropology from Trent University, a postgraduate diploma in collections and conservation and management in collections conservation and management from Fleming College, a master's of archive and records management, and a master of museum studies from the University of Toronto. Before returning to the Grey Roots area to take on the position of assistant curator at Grey Roots, Nikita spent five years in Powell River, British Columbia, working as a collections manager for the Powell River, Powell River Historical Museum and Archives. Through her education and hands-on experience, Nikita has become adept at the maintenance, preservation, and display of all manner of artifacts. And now, welcome Nikita. Thanks, Karen. All right, so let me just share my screen and we will get on our way. So as Karen mentioned, today I'm going to talk about caring for our collections at home. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to talk to a bunch of different categories of uh, collection items because we kind of break them down into the material types. Um, and I'm going to provide some, some tips and best practices that we use in museums that can actually be translated into your home. So let's get started. So things that put our collections at risk. So there is a long list of things that can be damaging to our collections, um, whether it's furniture or metals or textiles, paper-based materials. Um, so these are kind of the main baddies that we want to watch out for when we're talking about caring for our collections. Um, so the first is light. Um, and we are talking about natural sunlight, infrared and UV light. And so this can also come from fluorescent lighting and incandescent lighting in our home. Uh, the damage from light is accumulative and irreversible, um, and it can really speed up deterioration in a lot of different material types. Next is relative humidity or just humidity. So the amount of moisture in the air, uh, improper humidity levels, either extremes in the low end or in the high end can be damaging to collections, um, both uh, biological and chemical, as well as causing some mechanical issues. And as we go through the different categories, I'll kind of talk to some of these a little more uh, closely. Then we have temperature. And again, it's really those temperature extremes, so extreme cold, extreme heat. And again, that can impact things biologically, chemically, mechanically. In terms of pests, we're really talking about insects, rodents, but also molds that can form and can be extremely damaging and sometimes cause really irreversible damage to our collections. Then pollutants. Now these are things that can be generated both in our homes and outside of our homes. So it can be um, the dust that comes in off the street or if you live near a busy highway, the exhaust fumes, um, from the road, uh, but also inside the home, it's things like dust, cigarette smoke or, or wood fire smoke, um, but also 
the byproducts that can come off of some materials that we use in our homes. So certain woods and adhesives um, that can actually be acidic or corrosive to our collections. And then us, we are extremely damaging to collections at times uh, in how we handle them, in how we clean them, in how we display and store them um, and use them. And we also can introduce a lot of pollutants into the environment like foods that can be attractants or pests or certain cleaning products that could actually be harsher than our intent is. And the last one is fire. And I'm really just gonna talk about it here because fire and smoke damage are pretty much completely damaging to collections. So we really just wanna make sure we're all practicing really safe fire safety practices in our homes. So what do our collections actually crave? So in an ideal situation, our collections would like nothing more than to live at a stable 20 degrees Celsius, 50% RH, with absolutely no doors and windows that are gonna allow in any light, no lighting fixtures, nothing, and nothing that any pests or people can enter to touch them. But obviously that's completely irrational because we all need to live in our homes and here at the museum too, we need to be in those spaces with the collections. So what can we provide as a best case environment for our collections? Well, we wanna keep a fairly stable temperature. Again, try and avoid those extremes of cold and heat. So keeping it between uh, 18 and 22 degrees Celsius, which is really comfortable for us as well. Uh, keeping the humidity levels in our homes between 45 and 55 degrees. Anything uh, higher than that, you could, um, increase the possibility for mold. Anything lower than that could also be damaging because it's too dry for some collection types. And then we wanna just keep our collections out of that direct sunlight as much as we can and change out all those incandescent and fluorescent lights for LED bulbs because they produce far less UV lighting. Um, and also they save us a little money on electricity bills. So kind of a positive. Um, and lastly, we just wanna practice safe handling proper storage and display practices and proper cleaning practices so that we're not introducing any damage. So one thing I just wanna kind of talk about before we get into the different categories is what I like to refer to as a collector's nightmare or a collection manager's nightmare. And this is something we call uh, inherent vice um, when we're talking about collections. And what inherent vice is, is it's, um, the tendency of an object to deteriorate on its own because of some fundamental instability, either in its chemical composition of how it was made or in the mechanical construction of it. Um, and these inherent vices can be really challenging to deal with. Um, they can be almost impossible to completely stop, um, but we can do things to kind of slow them down. Um, so they can be as simple as something like uh, dyes that are not color fast in, in textiles because a proper fixative wasn't used or a bad batch of adhesive when laying down a veneer on a wood piece of furniture. Um, so I will talk to a couple um, categories of, of object types that do have um, inherent vices that crop up occasionally. Um, so you'll see this little symbol um, come up later. So some preventative steps for all of our collections. So these are best practices that we can do for any of our historic items in our homes. So before we handle them um, or clean them or move them, we wanna make sure that we're taking off any jewelry that we have on our hands. So rings, bracelet, watches, even long necklaces, anything that could possibly catch or scratch or, or bang into um, the item we're carrying. Uh, or cleaning, um, it's just best practice to just take those things off our hands. We wanna wash our hands, make sure they're nice and clean, remove any oils or salts and any acids on our hands that can be potentially damaging to the collections and food. Um, if we've just eaten, we wanna wash our hands. Uh, before moving pieces, uh, we wanna make sure that we actually have a clear path from where we are with the object to where we wanna take it and to make sure where we're taking it is a clean level surface. Um, so we don't have any accidents as we're moving our pieces. We want to keep our items, as I mentioned, out of that direct sunlight, get those LED bulbs in our fixtures. And we want to avoid storing our collections in spaces that are not climate controlled. Um, so attics, basements, garages especially, they're not ideal for storage because they're often not climate controlled. Um, they can be places where we see mold and mildew crop up and we can get those fluctuating temperatures that we want to avoid. 
We also want to practice good house cleaning. So we want to haul out that vacuum and vacuum uh, fairly frequently um, to help keep those dust levels down. Um, and this will just reduce the need to clean our collections. And one of the best things we can do is handle our collections as little as possible. So not having to clean them as often will actually preserve them for a lot longer. If we are moving any larger objects, it's best to not wear anything too loose. Again, we don't want it to catch or snag and we wanna wear proper footwear. So again, we're not having any accidents with our pieces that could hurt them as well as ourselves. Um, when we're storing items, we wanna really focus on using acid-free paper products. So archival quality products, um, but really the acid-free is, is the important part there. Um, and also we wanna avoid using any PVC plastics in how we store our items because PVC is not a great plastic. It degrades and as it degrades, it releases hydrochloric acid, which can be quite damaging to a lot of different collections. So the first uh, category I'm gonna kind of speak to is textiles. Um, and I'm gonna focus on the natural fibers. So cotton and linen, silk and wool, because those are typically the textiles that we um, tend to find in historic items. Um, so in terms of the most common causes of damage to textiles, uh, light is the first one. Um, this can be uh, really damaging in that it can fade um, both vegetable and chemical dyes in our textiles, but it can also um, embrittle the textile, um, the threads of the textile itself and weaken it over time, um, especially silk um, from light can get quite uh, embrittled. Uh, the next is improper uh, humidity. So especially those high humidity levels, um, they can lead to things like tide lines um, occurring in our textiles. Dye bleeds can happen in super high humidity. Um, we can also get shrinkage or distortion and even mold growth with those high humidity levels. Uh, in terms of uh, heat, so um, we're really talking about, again, high heat in this case, um, which can be really damaging and, and also encourage that drying out of the textile. Um, and in some cases, like in cotton, it can actually discolor it and yellow it over time. Um, when you combine high heat and humidity, uh, that can also encourage certain dyes to bleed even more. So you might see even more of that happening. Uh, next is us. Um, especially how we clean and how we handle and store our textiles, we can do some fairly damaging things to them, um, especially using our modern day washing machines on historic textiles. They're really uh, quite intense. Uh, and they might not be the best way of cleaning our textiles. Um, and then in terms of pests, we're really talking about um, certain moth species, as well as uh, some uh, dermestid beetle, uh, the carpet beetle, um, especially the larvae, they actually love to munch on some of these natural fibers. So the best way of kind of dealing with that is just to keep our textiles clean and make sure there's nothing that's attractive on them uh, that those pests would wanna come and check out. So when, uh, we clean textiles, one of the first things we can do is a dry cleaning. Now, when we talk about dry cleaning in museums, we're not talking about sending it out to the dry cleaner. Um, we're talking about vacuuming our textiles, which may sound a little odd, um, but it's actually a really great way of cleaning our textiles in a, in a fairly gentle way. Um, now, there's a few tools that we use because what we don't want to do is actually just stick our vacuum right on the textile because we could lift off elements of it or damage some of the fibers um, just by sticking our vacuum right on it. So the things that we like to use are a natural fiber brush, um, some nylon screening or window screening, which you can just pick up at uh, the local hardware store, um, and then just any sharp edges um, using some cotton bias tape or even some painter's tape just to smooth those out so they don't catch on the textile. Um, and then your vacuum. And we want to use the lowest suction we can with our vacuum. And the screening basically just kind of acts as a support on the textile and will keep any elements getting sucked up. Um, and then 
uh, to access any uh, seams or pockets or anything that you can't really get to with the screening. Um, you could actually use some cheesecloth or pantyhose or even some of that screening over the nozzle of your vacuum and uh, you can um, use the brush and get into those seams or creases and into the pockets and vacuum them that way. And you want to make sure you do both sides of your textiles. And that's a great way of removing dust um, and any food particles that could be on, on your textile. Once you've done a dry clean, um, you may want to do a wet clean for your textile, or it might just be something that you want to you wanna wash your textile maybe before storage. Um, the important thing to remember is every time a textile is washed, it actually suffers a degree of of loss. So any loose or broken fibers can be washed away. So doing this is going to um, not deteriorate your garment right away, but it will it will age, work with the aging process. Um, some cleaning methods, as I kind of mentioned, are much harsher than others, especially our modern day tumble action machines. Um, they are really quite damaging and that includes both the machines we have at home, but also the machines that commercial dry cleaners use. Um, the beading action actually is quite damaging in those machines. And then any spin cycle will crush the textile. So for our really old, <laughs> old textiles, this might not be the best way to wash them. It could actually lead to quite a bit of damage. The other thing we want to consider before we do any wet cleaning um, is to check the wet fastness, wash fastness, and crock fastness of any uh, dyes that are in the textile. So whether it's threads or parts of the textile, like in a quilt, different parts um, might be dyed differently or have different patterns. Um, if we haven't washed it before and don't know for sure if the dyes are in fact fixed. Um, we do want to test that before we move ahead with a wet cleaning. So a good way to do that at home is just to put some um, paper towel underneath your, your textile and just in some inconspicuous areas, take some other a uh, little bit of paper towel, dampen it uh, with water um, to check the wet fastness. For wash fastness, you'd want to use your actual cleaning solution. Um, and then crock fastness is actually that's like rubbing. So you could just uh, do a little gentle rubbing um, on that that specific um, color or thread just to make sure that it's not um, gonna run because we don't want we don't want this to happen. <laughs> um, the other thing uh, to make note of though is if you do test for your wet fastness, wash fastness, and let's say you leave on those um, dampened pieces for. 10, 15 minutes, uh, just because the dye doesn't run in those 10, 15 minutes in your test, uh, doesn't mean that it would run if you left your garment or your textile soaking for an hour in a solution. Um, so just something to keep in mind that we're really testing for the length of time as well when we're talking about washing. So with the wet cleaning, um, we also wanna make sure we know what the textile is that we're washing because obviously different textiles kind of have different requirements. We're not going to wash our wools in super high heat. <laughs> we also want to make note of any damaged areas or areas of weakness in the textile so that we're aware of that when we're doing the washing. It's also best to avoid any of the commercial detergents or chlorine bleach. Um, in the museum, um, the standard among museum professionals is to use something like Orvis WA paste, which is a mild dye and scent free detergent. Um, because all those commercial products, they can be really quite harsh and they're often perfumed and have colorants in them that we don't necessarily want to introduce into our historic textiles. Um, so Orvis is readily available. Um, you can find it on Amazon, um, at textile stores. The water temperature, we really want to keep it um, in the warm category, not too hot, not too cold. Um, so slightly warmer than, than room temperature. And an important thing to, to also keep in mind is textiles will always be weaker when they are wet. Um, so you, when we're washing them, we don't want to over agitate them, especially if they're really fragile. Um, and we can also introduce a support when we're washing them. So that same um, nylon screening that we use, window screening, uh, you can actually use that to support your textile. So if you had, say, a, a silk handkerchief that was quite delicate, you could put that on the nylon and then submerge it into the water and have that be a support for the piece. Uh, it's best to wash antique textiles flat. Um, 
So, you know, in the museum, we have various sized um, tubs and containers we use. At home, um, your best bet might be to use your bathtub for some larger textiles. So just a nice clean bathtub. Um, and once your garment is submerged, you don't, as I mentioned, want to agitate it. All you want to do is gently press the water and the suds from your mild detergent through the material. Um, one of the things you can also use is a uh, natural sea sponge and just sponge the textile to activate the detergent and, and push it through the textile. As your water becomes soiled, we wanna replace it um, several times, making sure we rinse out all the detergent and all the soiling before we take the garment out of its wet cleaning bath. And just remember to be overly cautious whenever wa washing any antique textiles. Um, make sure you know what you're working with. Do those tests to make sure things are color fast. Uh, secure any fragile or loose elements before, or if they're easily removable, um, consider removing them. And then just be patient and handle your textile with great care. Once you're done washing, um, it's important to dry the textiles as quickly as possible. Um, the best thing to do uh, is to just place them between some terry towels and pour some cotton towels and just blot any excess water out of them. Um, ideally, we want to dry our textiles flat, but if they are um, strong enough to be um, hung, they can handle that, then you can also hang them to dry. Um, during this drying phase too, while the, the garment or the textile is still wet, you may want to block out the textile, which is just manipulating it back into its original shape um, so that it dries back into its original shape. Um, so you can see in the image at the bottom of the screen here, um, they've actually used little pins to just pin out the piece as it's drying um, so that it, it dries straight and flat. And then you can incorporate fans um, in a cool setting and just have them blow across the textile to help dry them. And then it's important to never store a textile until it's completely dry. So in terms of storing our textiles, once they've been washed and dried and cleaned, uh, boxes are a great option. Um, we just want to avoid cardboard boxes, um, those brown ones, because they are not acid free and they can actually discolor our textiles over time. Um, again, we want to use that white and buffer tissue paper for wrapping textiles, or we can also use a washed and an undyed muslin. Um, the thing is to just avoid anything that is colored or that has a pattern to it, because in that high humidity situation, those could transfer and, and stain your, your textile. Um, it's best to avoid metal and wooden hangers when hanging textiles for storage. Um, the large plastic hangers are best, um, especially if we pad them out with some cotton um, batting or even um, the example at the bottom here is uh, some polyethylene um, thermal tubing, uh, which polyethylene is really stable plastic um, and we've just put it around. They're using a metal hanger here and then covering it with some like muslin um, or just some cotton and then hanging the garment that way. Um, I would not recommend using pool noodles because we just don't know what the plastic is in a lot of them, especially if we just get them from the dollar store. So I don't, wouldn't be able to to know how they're gonna deteriorate and if they're gonna off gas anything we don't want when they deteriorate. Um, we also wanna uh, support our textiles along any fold line. So if we're folding them to store them in boxes or drawers or in cupboards, um, anytime we make a fold, we wanna pat out that fold. So we're not getting a knife edge crease because those will over time become a weak points that could end in breakage in your, your textile. Um, so just taking some acid-free tissue paper and crumpling it up into a fat little snake and just sticking that in all your folds, um, that will just round out uh, those fold lines. Uh, the other thing, if we're storing something longer term, is to pad out any embellishments, um, any uh, buttons or medals, if it's a military uniform, it's good just to wrap them in some uh, acid-free tissue just to keep them from snagging other parts of the garment. Uh, and then if we are hanging things long term, consider using dust uh, covers so we don't have to clean them again. So the next category is wood um, and wood objects, there's, many different types um, and many different finishes. Today, I'm gonna speak to clear varnished wood pieces and their care specifically. So with wood, again, um, sunlight, that UV light is really damaging um, to the finishes, especially of wood furniture. 
uh, moisture, especially again, those extremes, lots of humidity, very dry conditions, um, they can cause physical changes in the wood as the wood will swell and shrink, which can lead to warping of parts of your furniture piece. Uh, temperature can be, um, again, those extremes of too hot, too cold, couldn't be damaging to certain finishes and adhesives um, used in the construction of your wooden furniture. And then lastly, us. Uh, especially uh, how we use and clean our furniture um, because uh, a lot of us might actually be cleaning our furniture way too often um, with commercial products, um, but also how we use it. Uh, a lot of antique furniture was not built for modern bodies. Uh, so just taking care and how we're using them uh, and remembering that they were meant for a different time period. So cleaning our wood furniture. So there is this myth um, out there that furniture needs to be fed or it will dry out. Um, and this isn't really true if you're keeping your, your wood furniture in those kind of uh, good conditions of 50%, around 50% RH. If the humidity gets too low, then obviously your wood can dry out and that can be damaging, but adding oils um, to it is not gonna really impact it as much as keeping it at that stable RH. Um, we don't typically use furniture oils at all in museum collections. Many of them contain things like linseed oil or other drying oils, which when we use them repeatedly, um, they can actually obscure the wood grain because they become gummy and insoluble and quite dark on the surface. So you lose that wood grain um, beneath them. Other furniture polishes contain non-drying oils because they want to give you that glossy look. Um, and those are damaging in that they can actually entrap dirt and dust and grime on the surface, which if we're using our furniture, those, that can become abrasive and actually dull the finish over time. And then many spray polishes, um, they contain silicone, uh, which leaves uh, a film on the surface and which this film can actually seep through the wood finish, through little micro fissures and impregnate the wood beneath. Um, and this becomes really uh, problematic if you ever wanna refinish the piece um, because you get this condition called uh, fisheye, which is where uh, your new say varnish layer doesn't sit flat on the surface. You get that like modeled um, appearance. And really the only way to kind of get that silicone out of the wood is to go down layers until you get cast it. And if you have a veneer finish, um, you, the veneer layer might have to be removed. So what is the best thing to use? Um, so for clear varnish furniture, uh, a good coating of a really high quality paste wax is really all that you need. Uh, wax is very stable. It does not change chemically over time like some other products. Uh, and it provides protection against moisture and airborne pollutants. Um, so all you need to do is apply a very thin coat following the manufacturer's specifications um, just once a year. Uh, I will make a note though that this might not be appropriate if your finish is not in good condition or if there are gilded elements or painted elements. Um, so it's, it's important to do your research before you do use a paste wax, but on just clear varnished furniture in good condition, it's a really good option. Um, and then once that protective coating is on, you basically just can dust it with a soft cloth and give it a little buff to keep it looking good throughout the year. Um, one other component of wooden furniture that you might consider cleaning, of course, is any hardware. Um, so if it does have a hardware, like a brass hardware that you want to be shiny, so you're considering polishing it, I would recommend removing it from the furniture because even the gentlest of polishes can be quite abrasive and damage the finish of your furniture. Um, within the museum, um, we would probably not even bother polishing these pieces. We would just take a clean, dry cotton cloth and just buff them until we get a nice gleam on them um, and just avoid using uh, any, anything that could possibly damage the wood. When we're moving furniture, um, we wanna make sure that we check for any loose or damaged joinery. Uh, we wanna remove any removable elements. Uh, so drawers and shelves, doors if we can. If not, we wanna make sure they're well secured before we move the piece. We want to make sure with tables that we're lifting them by their apron or their legs, um, especially antique pieces, sometimes those tops will just pop right off. Um, and with chairs, 
carrying them by the seat rather than the press rail or arms, because again, over time, those can pop off. Um, and then when moving larger pieces that are quite heavy, we really want to try to avoid dragging them, especially if they have like feet, um, because that lateral pressure, um, you can actually shear them right off. Uh, so if you can even get it up on a dolly and then roll it, that would be the best um, than trying to drag it across uh, a floor space. Uh, in terms of the display and storage, as we mentioned, we want to keep that furniture out of that direct sunlight. Um, so using curtains or blinds can be really useful just to, to lower that intensity um, of UV light. The other thing you can consider um, if you have lots of windows and you love the natural light coming in is using something like a UV filtering film on your windows. This is a little bit more of an expensive option, but it is something to consider. Uh, we also want to avoid storing our furniture in spaces that are not climate controlled, again, avoiding those extremes. Um, and if storing furniture in a space that has a cement floor, we actually want to keep the furniture off the cement um, because the cement can release moisture that could um, warp the wood or could encourage mold growth. So putting it on something like pallets, just raising it up so there's some airflow and it's not directly on the cement. And also when in storage, dust covers are a fantastic idea, keeps us from having to clean them. Uh, white cotton sheets work really well. You can even put a layer of plastic if you're worried about leaks, depending on where you're storing your furniture. Um, the other thing you can do, um, I didn't really mention pests as a problem for wooden furniture, but they can be. Um, there are certain insects that are wood boring or, or rodents sometimes like to make homes and drawers of furniture pieces stored in barns or sheds. Um, one of the ways you can kind of monitor this, it's really easy, is to put like a white drop cloth beneath your furniture. And that way, if any um, droppings or, or bug frass or any, anything that these pests leave behind, if you'll see it collect on the white um, drop cloth, and then you'll know that you have an issue right away. So next up is shiny metals. So metals kind of are broken down into two categories. We have our ferrous or iron-based metals and our non-ferrous, uh, non-iron-based metals. So today I'm going to speak uh, to the non-ferrous, the shiny metals. So our tin, our silver, our brass, and our bronze. Now these items typically are some of our most durable. Um, they can often withstand, you know, sunlight and and certain temperature extremes more so than others, um, but they can still be damaged. Uh, one of the things we really need to look out for with metals is corrosion, um, not just tarnishing, but actual active corrosion. Um, and so that can be caused by things like pollutants or high humidity levels. So the things that really can cause the most damage for metal pieces are first and foremost us, especially how we use and handle and also improper over cleaning of our shiny metals. Uh, pollutants, there are certain um, pollutants that will encourage um, corrosion in metals and I'll, I'll speak to a few of them in the following slides. And then again, as I mentioned, that high humidity. Um, so corrosion will become more active in higher humidities and will become less active in lower humidity. So anything above that 50%, you're going to encourage more corrosion. One other thing to mention about metals, um, and this is true of a lot of the categories I'm going to speak to today, but metals in particular are often part of composite objects. And these are objects that have different materials combined together. So you can have metal and leather, metal and wood, metal and glass. Um, and so the important thing to consider when we are working with composite objects is that we're dealing with different material types that may have different needs. Um, so just something to consider as uh, you're caring for your metal items, if they do have other composite pieces that maybe a treatment might not, or um, a way of cleaning might not actually be a good way of cleaning because it has a wooden element. So generally, um, good care of shiny metals, if they are in high use, so your silverware, if you use it actively, um, you just want to make sure that anytime you're using it, that you are cleaning and drying it and removing any deposits, any food residues um, that could possibly um, encourage corrosion or tarnishing. Um, and just make sure we clean and dry them really well before we put them back into storage. 
um, metal objects that we don't uh, use frequently. So the pieces that are more just for display or decoration, um, we really just wanna try to avoid touching them as much as we can with our bare hands um, because those oils and salts under your hands can actually etch right into certain metals um, and, and leave behind not so nice looking fingerprints. So using cotton or nitrile gloves when we handle those pieces is a really good idea. Um, we want to avoid immersing our metal pieces fully in water and soaking them for a long period of time, um, especially if there are so soldered components to them, um, because those can be uh, areas where corrosion can get started. Um, and never use a dishwasher. It's just, it's just way too harsh. Um, one thing to note, especially because uh, in this part of the world where we have a lot of rural areas where people are on wells, um, if you do have hard water or water that has a higher iron content, you may consider uh, rinsing your items using distilled water, which is readily available. You can buy it at Walmart, at the grocery stores, at Shoppers Drug Mart. Um, but that distilled water will just be a, a more pure water and won't leave behind any residue or heavy metals that could possibly encourage that corrosion. And again, anytime we are rinsing those pieces, um, we wanna make sure they're really, really dry using a soft lint-free cloth. Uh, so cleaning, when we are cleaning our metals, we always wanna first begin with a dusting and remove any of that loose dust or dirt or soiling. Um, the reason we do that is because if we do move forward with say a wet clean or even a polish, if that dust, which can be quite abrasive is still on, um, rubbing it into the surface of the, sorry, <clears throat> rubbing it into the surface of the metal could be uh, quite abrasive um, and you could scratch or, or scuff the metal. Um, so we wanna dust it first. For those metals in really good condition where they don't have a lot of, or no solder joints, um, you can do a wet cleaning. Uh, again, distilled water would be best. Um, and then a small amount of a mild detergent like Orvis uh, to remove any grimy um, uh, or oily or food-based residue. Uh, and then rinse with distilled water again and dry thoroughly. Um, if you have a coin collection, it's actually recommended that you do wash them before you put them in storage, um, just because in the past they may have been handled by someone who wasn't wearing gloves. Um, and so we do just wanna degrease them and remove any of those residues. And this type of a clean um, will not affect the underlying patina. Uh, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about polishing. Now, the overcleaning or polishing of metal is, is often because we have this desire for our metals to be beautiful and shiny and bright looking. Um, but the important thing to remember when we polish our metals is that you are removing some of the original metal when you are removing that tarnish with those polishes um, because they use harsh abrasives or acids or alkalis. Um, and so over time, you can actually remove uh, decorative details or plating or even um, hallmarks that could be quite identifying and, and add to the value of your piece. Um, many commercial silver polishes in particular, they do contain ammonia, um, which can actually dissolve copper over time, um, the copper from sterling silver, or that is the base metal beneath silver plating. So it's just something to consider. Um, it's always best to start with the most gentle polishing um, process that you can. Uh, so something that we use in the museum is something that we make ourselves, um, which is a very a gentle but effective polish. And we use precipitated calcium carbonate, otherwise known as precipitated chalk, um, which you can get online really easily. Um, and we mix that with distilled water to form a paste. And now the more diluted the paste is, the gentler it will be. Um, but whether you use uh, kind of that at-home uh, option or you do use a commercial polish, um, the thing to remember is that less is always more. And that's both in terms of how much of the polish you use and how frequently you use it. Um, also to rinse off and make sure you rinse the metals really well and get all of that cleaning residue off because that can actually promote corrosion if it's left behind, especially in any um, filigree or detail, raised detail work where it gets like stuck in crevices, you wanna make sure you're getting all of that out. Um, and then of course, dry your piece, piece thoroughly before you put it back into storage or display. 
So displaying and storing shiny metals, um, you do wanna avoid using latex gloves. And this is also in the handling of them, especially around silver, um, because latex has sulfur, which uh, can cause tarnish in silver. You also wanna avoid storage um, in wooden cabinets, uh, shelving, display case, anything that's made of wood where the wood is in direct contact. And that's because the wood can um, emit acidic vapors that can um, encourage corrosion in certain metals. Oak cabinets in particular um, should be avoided. But if you do have wood um, furniture that you're using to display your pieces, um, you can create a barrier um, using uh, a stable polyethylene or polyester plastic like mylar, which is clear sheeting, and just put that down before you put your metals on top. Um, or glass shelving is a great option if you can swap out those wooden shelves for glass ones. Uh, tarnishing can also be minimized uh, by placing individual objects into polyethylene bags, just like polyethylene Ziploc bags. Um, and you can also use uh, plastic food grade uh, freezer containers. They're made of um, stable inert plastics. There is also a, a product called Silver Saver, which I have an image of. Um, the thing to remember though, if you are gonna use Silver Saver, which is totally fine to use, um, we often use it in museums as well, um, it doesn't last forever. So you will wanna check your pieces maybe every other year um, and just see if you need to replace um, and change out for a new, a new Silver Saver bag. All coins and metals and metallic art should always be stored individually in their own little protective holders. Again, these should always be made of an inert archival quality plastic. Um, so polyethylene, polypropylene, um, avoiding that PVC. We don't want that hydrochloric acid getting into our metals. Um, paper envelopes, also we wanna make sure the, the acid-free, good quality paper. Um, we want to avoid using newspaper. It's not acid free. And rubber bands, um, like latex, they can contain sulfur, which can be uh, tarnishing to things like silver. Um, also, and this is something I've seen quite commonly, is we actually want to avoid wrapping our uh, shiny metals, especially our silver, in saran wrap um, because it contains uh, polyvanillidine chloride. Um, which over time, it can degrade and release hydrogen chloride, which can be damaging to the metal. So switch out your saran wrap for those polyethylene bags. Um, and then also textiles such as wool or felt, um, they can also encourage tarnishing, um, again, because there's sulfur uh, in them. So the next category is glass. Um, now glass is like metals, it, you know, it can handle some UV lighting. Um, it's fairly stable, even in some uh, slightly larger temperature extremes, um, but it is extremely fragile. So the thing that causes the most damage to glass is us and us being clumsy around our items. The other thing with glass that can be quite damaging is that inherent vice that I kind of spoke of before. So what does that mean in glass? So with glass, when we're talking about inherent vice, that can happen in both the original chemical formula of the glass, but it can also happen in the manufacturing process, uh, specifically in the annealing phase of glass making where you're taking that molten glass and cooling it down and letting it harden. So the image, um, over here, uh, you see the bubble in the bottom, that is actually uh, like a manufacturing defect where this bubble has formed along the bottom edge of the glass. And that can be a point of weakness. It could also be a point of pressure in that piece of glass where if it's hit the wrong way, uh, the whole piece could just shatter on us. Um, so we wanna be aware of those. That's an inherent vice, a me uh, mechanical uh, inherent vice. Um, the other thing with glassware is, uh, in the chemical makeup of it, we get something that's called glass disease, otherwise known as sick glass or glass illness, which is a deterioration of the glass that results in weeping. So that middle photo where the glass kind of looks foggy and almost wet, um, crizzling, spalling, cracking and fragmentation. And we'll move through all those phases until it just basically comes apart. Um, and this is an instability because of the chemical composition of that glass piece. Um, unfortunately, there is no cure for glass disease, um, but we can slow it down um, if we have a piece that has it by um, 
keeping it in a lower temperature, uh, lower humidity environment, because then we'll reduce the um, amount of chemical reaction that's happening that's encouraging that deterioration. Now, if glass is in good condition, uh, it can be washed. Um, however, the thing to kind of avoid using actually is your sink. Your sink can actually be quite damaging because it's often a hard surface metal or ceramic or porcelain. Um, and your taps, your metal taps, they can get in the way and all of a sudden you're lifting a glass up and you hit your faucet and the glass is broken. Um, so what we would use in the museum is a plastic bowl or a tub to wash our glass items in. We would use lukewarm water because we don't want to go from an extreme heat to an extreme cool. So just a nice lukewarm water. Um, again, if you're in a hard water area, you might consider using distilled water instead of tap, just so you're not getting any fogginess or residue left on the glass once you're done cleaning it. Um, you just want to add one drop of detergent for every liter of water. So again, you could use Orvis. It's perfectly fine for glass or something like Dawn is really nice and mild. Um, washing one piece at a time is also really good practice. Uh, if you put a bunch of pieces in, they could move against each other and clack into each other and you could see some breakage or damage. Um, to actually wash them, just a soft cloth or an old t-shirt rag um, is really good. You can also use a soft brush. Um, nothing too abrasive because you don't want to dull the surface of the glass. And then it's best to allow glass uh, to air dry or to dry it with paper towels rather than a cloth or a towel, um, just because they can leave behind those like little fine fibers and um, then you might end up having to clean your glass all over again, which we wanna avoid cleaning them as much as possible. Uh, a quick tip when we are cleaning and caring for our glassware, it's a really good idea to put a nice thick soft towel down um, in our work area. So that way, if we have a little accident, if something slips, um, it will hopefully land on that soft surface and we won't see any breakage. So in terms of storing and displaying our glassware, um, it's best to store uh, glass items in a closed environment. So a cupboard that has doors, um, because this will just reduce uh, the amount of dust um, and therefore the need to clean them as frequently. Um, you can use a product like a microcrystalline wax. Sometimes um, it's referred to as a museum wax. I have an image of it there on my slide. Um, and this is really great for kind of securing your glass items to your shelves. And that way, if there are any vibrations from people walking past, um, the glassware is less likely to kind of walk away on you or walk off the shelf or walk into another piece. Um, so you just take a little bead of it in the lower photo, you can see the two glasses there. They have some underneath and that just secures it um, in a really gentle way. Um, also, if you are storing or displaying glasses together, um, it's best to keep them from touching. Cause again, if you're walking by or if there's a lot of vibration, um, they could vibrate against each other and that could lead to damage. Um, any items that you're stacking, you wanna interleave them um, so that they're not in direct contact with each other. So there aren't any little chips or, or scuffs um, or abrasion that happens. Um, so acid-free tissue paper, soft cloth, um, polyester foam padding, those are all really great options. Again, you wanna avoid using newspaper. Um, I've actually seen instances where, especially in slightly higher humidities, like if you are storing your glassware in the garage, um, those inks can actually transfer onto the glass, which isn't great. Um, and also bubble wrap you can use. Um, not all bubble wrap is created equal, however. So if you are gonna use bubble wrap, I would also suggest first wrapping or interleaving it between the glassware with some acid-free tissue, just in case it's, it's not a good quality bubble wrap. So next is ceramics. Uh, ceramics are very similar to glassware in that they can kind of withstand um, a lot of environmental challenges compared to some other pieces. Um, however, uh, there are a few things that can be quite damaging to them. Uh, in this instance, um, I'm going to speak to high fired ceramics as opposed to low fired ceramics, which are more of our earthenwares and terracottas. Um, and Often um, those low fired ceramics are unglazed. I'm gonna speak instead to the high fired ceramics or porcelains and stonewares that are often have a glaze, um, just cause I think they are probably more common um, in people's homes. So when it comes to those high fired ceramics, um, again, it's us and our clumsy handling that can be quite damaging um, 
to, to our ceramics, but also uh, inherent vice is again an issue with certain ceramics. So when we speak of inherent vice in ceramics, um, it's really something that occurs in the manufacturing process, um, which does also include the, the composition of the clay itself. Um, so if there is an inadequate quantity of filler um, in the clay itself, you can get pieces that collapse in on themselves, um, such as the, the example, the first photo there. Um, now, hopefully this happens before the piece is, is fired and would usually happen or, or it would not fire properly so they wouldn't use it, but that is something in the, the early stages of making the ceramic that can be an inherent vice. Um, poor design and construction. Uh, so say the, the mug is made quite large and heavy and then a delicate little handle is added. Well, that's a, a design inherent vice. So over time that handle is probably gonna be far too weak and will end in breakage if you are using it regularly. Um, incorrect firing can result uh, in breakage as well, especially if things are fired too rapidly or allowed to dry out too fast. Um, this can often happen right in the kiln itself and you'll open the door and they'll be all broken up. Um, but sometimes we just get little firing cracks that in say something like a teapot or a vase might not be as noticeable if they're really only presenting themselves on the interior. And these can be weak points like that bubble in the glass. Um, also, we see uh, crazing and pitting in the glazing um, sometimes, which are the last two photos. And with those, they are considered inherent vices because they can allow soiling and moisture into that substrate um, of, the, of the ceramic and, and can weaken it over time. So general care of ceramics, we want to avoid lifting our ceramics by the rim or parts that protrude, such as their handles or spouts or knobs or the limbs of figurines. Um, these are often the weakest points. And if it's an antique piece that we've collected, they may have actually been repaired in the past and it's just maybe not obvious. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are supporting those pieces by their body. Um, if a ceramic is badly stained and regular washing doesn't seem to remove it, um, I highly recommend not using any bleach or acid formulas that are kind of recommended on blogs or how-to books um, because actually trying to dissolve those stains, um, you could end up actually dissolving part of the, the artifact, part of that antique itself. Um, when you are uh, maybe purchasing an antique piece or you're just concerned about um, its condition for cleaning. Uh, one way to kind of uh, figure out if there is any structural damage to your ceramic is just to take your fingernail and lightly tap on it. If there is a clear ringing tone, your ceramic is intact and in good condition. But if it sounds dull, there is likely a structural flaw. So that's just a little quick tip. So some do's and don'ts with our ceramics, like everything else, we want to dust them um, because those abrasive dust particles could dull the surface and they just don't look great. Um, do not put your antique ceramics into the dishwasher. Those hot temperatures, those high pressure water, um, aggressive detergents, they can permanently damage the finish of your ceramic. And if you did put an unglazed ceramic in, could just completely destroy it, melt it away. Uh, do check your glazed ceramics um, for chips or cracks that could allow uh, dirt and water to enter into that substrate of the ceramic and could lead to staining. Um, and also, as mentioned before, let's avoid using those household leeches and other proprietary cleaners um, because they can penetrate into the ceramic, they can damage the gilding or the enamel or even dull the overall glaze of our piece, which we just don't want. So high fired ceramics that are in good condition, um, that don't have any uh, break points or chips or cracks, um, you can clean them, uh, do a wet clean or wash them. It's still recommended not to fully submerge them or let them soak in water because there could be um, points of access for the water that we're just not seeing. Um, so you can just take some uh, cotton wool uh, cotton wool balls, or even a Q-tip if you're cleaning an area that is kind of hard to get to or tight. Um, again, we want to use a plastic container, avoid using our 
potentially damaging sinks. Um, and again, just using uh, that mild detergent like an Orvis or a Dawn um, works really well. And that warm, not too hot, not too cold water. And then uh, we're just gonna take our dampened cotton, um, squeeze out any excess water and just roll that over the surface of our ceramic to clean it. And as the cotton ball becomes dirty, just swap it out for a new one, just so we're not introducing any soiling possibly into any cracks um, or crazing in, the, in the, the finish of the ceramic piece. Um, once it's clean, we wanna rinse it well. Distilled water again might be your best option um, if you are in a hard water area and then blot dry with a paper towel or leave it to air dry. And again, good tip is to put down that thick towel. Um, so if we do have accidents, we hopefully don't hear the sound of anything breaking. So storing our ceramics is very similar to the glassware, um, the glass items. Uh, they are also best stored in closed cabinets to limit the dust and therefore the need to clean them. Uh, if you're storing them in boxes or cupboards or shelves, we do wanna try to store them in places where they're not gonna get vibrated or jostled or jarred a lot. We wanna pad them out if we are um, stacking them or putting them in boxes, again, with acid-free tissue paper, polyethylene foam, or again, we can use bubble wrap. Um, and the microcrystalline wax can also be used with these high-fired ceramics that have glazes. Um, I would not recommend using it on anything that is unglazed because the wax could actually get into that unglazed um, ceramic and, and it can distort the color and just make it not look nice. Um, so only on glazed pieces. Um, otherwise, the little silicone bumper pads in the bottom corner there that you put on your cupboard doors, those are actually really um, great to put around the bases of your ceramic pieces so say you have a, a tall vase or something um, and those will just kind of stabilize it and again keep it from walking um, off off your pedestal or your shelf so next is paper-based media um, so when we're talking about paper-based items this includes documents maps newspapers books scrapbooks photographs works of art on paper many many different things um, i'm only going to speak to photographs because this is probably the thing that everyone has at home um, so in terms of our historic photographs, uh, the things that can cause the most damage are, again, light, which can uh, embrittle and age the paper. Um, it can also discolor it sometimes. Paper can also occasionally go yellow or, or change uh, color in, in high UV light, um, but it can also affect the image itself and it can fade it or discolor it if it's a, if it's a later color photograph. Um, Incorrect RH. Uh, so again, those high humidity le le levels, um, they can actually cause tide lines in photographs. Um, if there are any inks, um, they can migrate into the image if they've been written on the back. Um, it can also cause the emulsion on certain types of historic photos to kind of soften and, and even stick to glass or stick to another photo, um, which can then be really difficult to separate. And then us again, and it's how we handle and how we store our paper and our photo products. Um, so just we want to make sure that we are following best practices. So the general care um, of photos, we always want to handle our photographs as with everything else with nice clean dry hands. Uh, we want to handle our photos by their extreme edges or their corners um, or use cotton or nitrile gloves. Um, fingerprints, just like with metals, can be really disfiguring to the emulsion, um, the photo itself, um, and they can you can actually leave fingerprints etched into the image of the photograph. Um, we also want to handle them carefully so we're not creasing them or rolling them or causing tears. Um, so we might consider actually using a support, either a heavy piece of cardstock beneath the photo, or even uh, some of that polyester mylar sheeting or polyethylene sleeves. Um, and once they're in those sleeves, um, then we can just handle them. And we don't really have to worry about touching the, the surface of the photo because they're being protected by that, that barrier as well as being supported. We want to avoid the use of rubber bands, post-it notes, metal fasteners like paper clips and staples. These can damage stain and actually rust our prints. Um, I also recommend if you do have any photos that have been torn or there, or there might be a tear through it, um, not to use pressure sensitive tape to do any at-home repairs. Even the ones that are um, 
you know, said to be archival, uh, over time, those adhesives don't always age well, and they may be quite damaging and disfiguring, as you can see the example in the top there, uh, to the image and can be really hard to remove later on. Um, so the best thing is if you do have a photo that's torn is to stick it in like a polyethylene sleeve. Um, the image could be scanned and those tear lines could be digitally removed and then you could have a new version of it. Um, or if you want the original re repaired, it's best to talk to someone who specializes in photographic repair. It's also a really good idea to never laminate your photographs or really any valuable document. The process is irreversible. Um, you cannot get the photo back out without damaging it. Um, so again, that polyester mylar sleeves, they're gonna be the best alternative um, to lamination. And then if you are gonna label your photographs, which any archivist, they would very much appreciate you to do, um, do so using a graphite pencil and not uh, ink or markers because the, the inks or the dyes in the marker, they can uh, bleed through and stain the image um, where a soft graphite pencil isn't going to do that to your, your photographic prints. So in terms of display and storage, um, if you do have some uh, historic images, maybe some really old family photos that you want to display, you actually might want to consider having um, a duplicate, a digital copy um, made and then print that and use that duplicate as uh, the piece you use for display and then store the original so that it lasts for a much longer time. Um, but if you do want to display the original, um, just maybe consider rotating it out. So maybe only having it up for a couple months and then swapping it with a different image and then bringing it back out several months later. Um, and that will just minimize its exposure to any light that could be damaging or any environmental conditions that could be damaging. Um, when we are displaying our photos, we want to keep those temperature and humidity fluctuations down. So keeping things away from external walls or sources of heat or moisture. Um, again, not putting them in the line of direct sunlight, changing out our uh, artificial lighting to LEDs, so no fluorescent or incandescent bulbs that are just directly hitting them. Uh, and then we also want to consider selecting album styles for storage that are actually safe um, for the removal of our photos. So those old fashioned albums with the sticky backs and the plastic covers that age and turn brown and the plastic gets embrittled, we don't wanna use those. Um, the best thing is again, those polyester or polypropylene sleeves that the images can just slide in and out of or an acid-free cardstock with um, little all archival photo mounting corners. Those are really great to use as well. Um, if you do have some historic albums that are some of those older styles that maybe aren't great, um, it actually might be best to not attempt to remove the photos um, from them yourself without consulting an, an archivist or um, a paper conservator. Uh, because you could actually damage the images, especially if they are glued down or if they're stuck together. Um, one of the things you can do um, to kind of keep those older albums and that from happening is you could interleave the pages with some archival um, acid-free tissue paper. Um, but the thing to remember if you are interleaving is you will bulk out the album, which could put some strain on the binding of it. Um, these historic albums, you could also have them uh, scanned or, or photographed, so you have a digital copy of them as well. So you have kind of a backup if anything does happen to it. Uh, another great way of storing photos also, as well as negatives is um, in acid-free storage boxes. We love boxes, they keep out light and dust. Um, and uh, if you are gonna store your photos or your negatives, it's best again, if you wanna interleave them either with some tissue or you can also get um, acid-free envelopes that fit different photo sizes and, and store them that way in the box. And then just practice good housekeeping and regularly check for pest and mold activity. So lastly, my last category is uh, basketry. Um, so this includes baskets, mats, hats, anything that's been woven together using plant material um, or occasionally things like porcupine quills as well. Um, now, the thing that is most damaging to our basketry is, again, us. And it's not just us modern, but also us in the past who may have used any historic basketry, um, what we stored in it, those can all be potentially damaging. 
Um, so physical forces as well, how we use them, um, handles and things like that can be easily damaged over long-term use. Uh, so we just wanna think about that. And also again, how we clean and store them um, if we're not following proper practices. Uh, in terms of light, sunlight can quickly change the look and feel of our baskets. Um, UV radiation in particular uh, can really damage any natural dyes used in the basketry. And it can also discover, uh, discolor the plant fibers themselves over long time, um, over long term exposure. Uh, there are two common insect pests that can impact our basketry collections. Um, these are the cigarette beetle and the drugstore beetle. Um, then they actually like to tunnel through those plant fibers. Um, also, if there are any attractants, um, like if a basket was used to store foodstuffs, um, we could have a concern of um, rodents also being attracted to them, and then they can soil um, them further uh, and just make them not look so great. Uh, pollutants, specifically dust and dirt, can accumulate, especially because of those intricate weaves of our basketry. Um, and then having to clean that can be uh, quite time consuming, but also can lead to additional damage and stress to the structure of the basket. Uh, and finally, uh, humidity. High humidity, again, um, can weaken the strength and stiffness of our basketry. Um, it can cause it to swell and shrink. Um, and also certain dyes and pigments um, can bleed with high humidity. So for cleaning our best basketry, the best thing we can do is actually, like with our textiles, do a dry clean with a vacuum. In this case, um, we want to use a low suction vacuum. We can again put some uh, pantyhose or um, uh, some that nylon um, uh, window screening over the top. So if any uh, bits or components do come loose, we catch them and we can just hold on to them. Um, and we want to start cleaning uh, with our natural fiber brush, brushing from the top to the bottom into the vacuum. Um, and also don't forget to do the inside and the bottom of your basket as well. Uh, if you're finding that, that dry cleaning isn't quite cleaning your basket enough, um, something you can use is a latex-free makeup sponges or a vulcanized rubber sponge. And just gently rubbing that on the surface will remove any additional um, dirt. It is really important though to pay attention that you're not doing any damage to the fibers of the basket if you are using these products. And if you are successful and are able to clean uh, using these items, often they do leave behind some debris. Um, so you'll wanna just do a vacuum to clean that up after. It is best to avoid using huge amounts of water when cleaning our basket. I did have one lady tell me that she just stuck some of her baskets in her shower and hosed them down. I highly recommend not doing that. Um, that's a lot of moisture being added. Um, and as we mentioned, that can cause some mechanical stresses. It can also, if it, they're not dried properly, it could encourage some mold growth. Um, but the wet clean that you can do, again, if you're finding that those dry cleaning options aren't working so well, um, a little bit of distilled water on a dampened Q-tip and just rolling that along the surface. So those two bottom images, that's actually a birch bark, a canoe with some um, porcupine quill decoration that I cleaned and I'm just using a Q-tip with some distilled water and just rolling along the surface to get off that, that really dirty grime that was on it. Um, and that worked really well. Um, it is important to check with any dyes though, that again, they are color fast, they're not, they're wet fast if you are gonna use this uh, cleaning method. So some general care, uh, always again, handle with clean, dry hands. Uh, when picking up our basketry, just like with our ceramics, we wanna do it with both hands and um, hold the body of the ceramic. Those rims and handles, um, they may at one time have been really strong to support the weight, but over time, those become like key break breakage points. So those first two images, you'll see the one lid, the second one, and it's literally popped right off um, because of someone just decided to pick it up by that little knob. Um, so handling it by its body. Uh, you also want to provide some support to your baskets. If they're, they are on display for a long time. So over time, they don't slump or misshape. Um, but you just want to make sure if you are providing a support, you're not over supporting or overstuffing it and putting too much pressure on the weave of the basket. Uh, 
Um, so some acid free tissue just crumpled up and put inside uh, some cardstock cut to just fit on the inside of the basket. Those are some really good options. And then if we are displaying or storing, we do want to refrain from stacking all of our baskets inside of each other because again, this can cause warping over time. Again, we want to avoid placing them near any place where we're going to see extremes in temperature or humidity. So windows, doorways, heater vents, um, keep them away from those areas. Uh, avoid that direct sunlight in particular, but any like UV light, as we mentioned, from fluorescence or incandescence as well. Um, so those first uh, two images, that first one, that's actually a, uh, a hat. And the second image, um, is the interior of the hat where you can see how vibrant those colors were compared to how dull they've become on the outside of the hat that's been exposed to light. And then that blue basket, again, the lid has protected the interior and where the rim of the lid was. Um, and you can see how much fading has actually happened over time from, from light exposure. We want to check our basketry fairly routinely if it's in storage. Um, for uh, pests or mold um, forming on the baskets. If we do find an infestation of either, the best thing to do is to seal it in a clear plastic bag, isolate it away from your other basketry um, and in a nice cool dry area, and then reach out to a conservator or call your local museum and kind of figure out um, and, and get their advice on what to do next. And then when they are in storage, uh, we also want to keep too much dust from accumulating so we don't have to clean them too frequently. So using those closed cabinets, boxes, dust covers are going to be a really useful tool. So that concludes caring for your collections at home. Thank you for hearing uh, my uh, lengthy presentation. I hope I was able to speak to uh, enough things that uh, you have items at home that you were able to get some good tips from. Um, and if there's any questions, I guess we'll open up to those now. Thanks, Nikita. That was great. Lots of uh, lots of great tips, suggestions. Um, your your own worst enemy, <laughs> probably. Um, uh, the first question is: Do you have any recommendations for framing special items? So. Um, you mentioned copy with photographs, but if someone had maybe something paper that's not a photograph that they're keen to show, but they also want to protect it. Sorry, can you, I didn't uh, hear that. Just um, how to frame things, uh, just for showing uh, things you can frame. Yeah, so um, if you are going to put something in a frame, um, the best thing to use is actually to put matting in between your photograph and your frame so that there is that space between the image and the glass. Um, you can actually buy um, glasses that have like built in UV protection. Um, so those uh, can be um, a good option. They, they do cost a little bit more, um, but that is an option that you can use. Thanks. Uh, and is there anything gentle a person can do if furniture has already been cleaned with commercial cleaners and has a residue? So your best bet is, is probably to reach out to your local museum or get in contact with either a furniture restorer or a conservator who can um, take a look at your piece. Um, it's, it's really hard to provide a, a one size fits all answer um, without seeing the piece because every piece does kind of have to be treated um, independently of the others. Um, but uh, if in the, the short term, just stop using them <laughs> would be the best answer. But yeah, reach out to um, any local furniture stores that you might know um, or, or, a, or a conservator or the museum um, to get you in touch with someone um, who can provide some guidance in, in how to remove that that disfiguring uh, layer. Um, if someone has a ceramic piece that has broken, yes. uh, do you have any suggestions, uh, at home suggestions for putting it back together? So again, um, with ceramic pieces, there is no one size fits all. Um, there are specific types of adhesives um, that conservators use to repair different types of ceramics. Um, it can depend on the ceramic itself. Um, 
and 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 where the join is um, that can uh, change the product that we actually use to fix it. Um, what I would recommend is not using um, any super glues uh, on the item. Um, but again, the best bet is to reach out to a museum or a conservator and and have them do it properly. Um, there is also this really uh, interesting Japanese practice um, where they actually uh, take their broken ceramics and they repair them using um, gold or silver. Um, and it's, it's really quite beautiful. So if the piece has some real sentimentality to you, that could also be an option. Um, but you're, yeah, you're going to want to speak to a conservator about the best way to repair it. Do you have any uh, tips for dealing with old bookstore smell? So not aggressive, but just uh... um, So specifically with books, is that the question? Yeah, yeah. Yes, that oh, must have musty. Yeah, so sometimes that mustiness can actually be a result of um, some mildew uh, that might be in the book itself. Um, one of the things you can actually do is air your books out. Um, so on a, a nice day uh, where it's nice and, and dry and there's a, a nice breeze, you could actually put them maybe just in your garage so they're not getting exposed to a lot of sunlight and just let them sit outside for several hours. Um, that can improve the mustiness. Um, you might also consider just doing a, a gentle vacuuming of the book. Um, I wouldn't recommend vacuuming the individual pages because you could potentially damage if there are any um, images or drawings or the text. Um, but if you just hold the book um, closed firmly by the spine and just vacuum the exterior of the book, um, if there is any mildew that's helping to cause that smell, you, that might help as well. Do you have any uh, top tools or materials for an amateur collector? The things to buy first. The, okay, so in, well, in terms of um, the care of your pieces, um, to keep things dust free, getting some really soft natural fiber brushes, um, they'll be good for basically all the things I spoke to. Um, some really uh, good quality like, um, t-shirt, rags, cotton rags, things like that. Um, what else is really useful? I mean, the distilled water, um, I really can't recommend that enough, especially if you do live more rurally, is actually having a supply of that for when you do want to do cleaning. Um, and then, yeah, finding, doing some research and finding a really good paste wax. Um, they're not all created equal uh, in terms of your wooden furniture. Um, some, I know like the Johnson brand, um, it can actually uh, kind of give a little bit of a yellow tint to your finish if you use it. So doing your research and finding a good clear one um, and having that in stock, um, those are really useful, useful items. I think this is the last question. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite part of collections management or the favorite thing that you worked on? Um, so my favorite part of working in collections management is that and I kind of mentioned this before, every single item, even if it's like the exact same piece, like we have duplicates of the same chair, if we have to do a repair or a treatment, it's always different. So the job it never gets boring for that reason. Um, so that's probably one of my favorite things. Uh, in terms of one of my favorite uh, things that I maybe treated, um, that birch bark uh, canoe with that quill work. That was a really fun project because um, it was going to go on exhibition and it had been in storage for so long because it um, wasn't looking so great. So being able to bring that back um, and make it look so nice so that people could actually enjoy it. That was a really fun project. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all it's all kind of fun. I'm one of those people that is very happy in what I do. I love my job. Well, thanks again, Nikita, all, all the work you put towards preparing the presentation and answering all the questions and yeah, so many materials that you covered. It's a, it's a great uh, overview for people. Thanks well, again. Th thank you. I, I hope it was informative for a lot of people. So thanks. Great. Take care. Thanks.